Today on Inside Utah Politics, a new chapter. After a 20-year run, Representative Patrice Aaron is retiring from the state legislature. She's here to look back on her distinguished career. Plus, her former colleagues will be gathering later this month to begin the 2021 legislative session. We're previewing the session with both sides of the aisle. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Glenn Mills. It is time to go Inside Utah Politics. We do begin today with Patrice Arendt. Patrice, great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. It's nice to be here. Thank you. 20 years coming to an end. What are your thoughts on that? I have been so fortunate to be able to serve my constituents and work on some incredibly interesting issues. I, I really do think I'm a very lucky person. Yeah, you have definitely taken up some interesting uh, issues, some of which I have been able to cover throughout my career in working with you up at the Capitol. You spent time in both the House and Senate. Give us a little uh, rundown of your, your career up there. When I first started, I ran for the House in a seat that Democrats just didn't win. There were no Democrats in the adjoining uh, seats. I was basically just a name on the ballot. I hadn't lived in that particular district for very long, although I was raised in Utah. Uh, I didn't know what a community council was. I didn't have any kids in the local schools. That I was nursing my son to keep him quiet during the fundraising phone call. So I wasn't exactly your ideal candidate. <laughs> Ran against a popular uh, Republican incumbent and won, which I think was a shock to everyone. And I uh, ran again. I was the number one target of the state Republican Party for the next few races. And then during redistricting, they just basically took that seat off the map. And I had this crazy idea I should run against the Senate majority leader in his district, which had become more Republican during redistricting. Somehow I won, served in the Senate. And then after 10 years of serving in the legislature, in addition to serving as associate general counsel to the legislature, I decided it was time to retire and recruited someone else to run in that seat. And I moved and I threw out the boxes with no intention of ever running again and did some other wonderful things in my life, went into law school teaching and then got a call from the Democratic Party a few years later, four years later, they were in a panic. They had no one to run in my new seat, which was also a Republican seat. Uh, but a Democrat had represented it once before and he had decided he didn't want to run for re-election and they had no one. So mm -hmm. I filed in that seat and have served in, in this district for the last decade. Let's get into some of the things you're most proud of. As you look back over the years, what are the uh, bills that you are most proud of that you were able to get through the legislature? Uh, let's see, I've passed almost 90, and which one of, of my children do I love the most? <laughs> uh, there are so many wonderful things I've been able to work on. Uh, I'm the founder and the co-chair of the Bipartisan Clean Air Caucus, and since we started that caucus in 2013, we've passed more cleaner legislation than in the history, prior history of our state. And I've passed a lot of those bills. And that's been very important to me. Um, many years ago, I passed our Utah newborn safe haven law. Um, very few states even actually had laws like this. We were concerned about babies ending up in dumpsters when their moms would get pregnant, often not admit to themselves they were pregnant, panic when the baby was born. And instead of keeping their child or putting their child up for you know, a traditional adoption, which would have been great. They did some very dangerous things with their children. So we wanted to give them another option and that law still exists today. They can anonymously bring their infant to any uh, hospital and drop the baby off and the baby's placed in a safe, loving home. I am, I've also worked on legislation to make it harder for those who want to steal our identities and I've worked on children's health care legislation. Um, it's illegal to smoke in a car when a child is present because of some legislation I worked on. Mm -hmm. And I also got to work on a lot of other health care issues for children having to do with asthma and diabetes. Um, I've also done a lot of election law. We had last year our uh, presidential primary, which is something I'd created. And um, also, you can no longer just check one box for straight ticket voting. Yeah, and, and that's something, that something you had I've been working on for years before it finally went through last year. It did with seven and a half minutes to spare. So I, I was lucky to get that through. I worked for many years on that. And then there are bills that don't even have my name on them that I worked so hard on. I think one of the pieces of legislation I worked the hardest on was the hate crimes bill, which I, was very I wanted, important to me. Yep, I wanted to bring that one up because I remember a moment where you and Senator Thatcher and Representative Perry were down on the side of the floor having a moment right after that had passed. And it was something that really stuck with me, that image. Talk to me about what was going on in that minute, because it was definitely, you could tell, such an important moment in your career. 
we had all worked on that bill for so long. I had personally, I think, talked to every member of the House and most members of the Senate about that bill. And when it actually passed the House, it passed with a much higher number than we anticipated. Uh, people that told me they were a firm no. And usually when you go into a, you know, a debate on a bill like that, you, you don't change a lot of minds because people have thought about those issues. And, and suddenly minds and hearts changed. And it was really a wonderful moment to, to come together and see that bill pass after all of those years. It meant so much to me and to the community I've grown up in. Mm -hmm. You were part of a minority caucus during your time in the legislature. You already mentioned you passed over 90 bills in your time there. How were you able to work as a member <laughs> of the minority party to get that accomplished? You know, you have to work hard. You have to be willing to listen to people on both sides of the aisle. And, you know, when I went in to pass a bill, when I wanted to present a bill, excuse me, I had to be completely prepared. I needed to know the answer to every question and really do my research and talk to every member of the committee first. I mean, that's and that's a good system. It's good to learn. And I learn from people and the bills changed. Uh, I wish everybody had to go through that process to get a bill passed. But I think listening and talking to everyone and bringing in all the advocates before you even start and the people that are going to oppose you. I worked on a bill that passed um, the last general session and we worked for months with people that I thought might be on the other side of the legislation. Ultimately, they passed it because we were able to bring everyone together. Why retire now? What came to this decision? No, it was just the time. I've been there for, you know, in the legislature for 20 years. Uh, there was no member of the House that had started before I did when I looked around on the floor at that very few senators. And it was time to figure out what the next chapter of my life is going to be. I don't know what that is yet, but it was time. Well, that was going to be my next question. What can we expect from you next? I would imagine you're going to want to stay involved in some capacity. Well, I'm certainly not retiring. As I tell my friends, I'm rewiring. Um, <laughs> I'm still going to be involved in some boards. I'm the chair of the Newborn ha Safe Haven Advisory Committee, and, we, and I've been working on that forever. I'm on the Envision Utah Executive Committee and a, and a number of other community boards because community service is so important to me. But I really don't know. When I retired last time from the legislature, I went into teaching at the University of Utah College of Law. Didn't anticipate that. So I don't know. I was hoping to take a trip during this legislative session to New Zealand, but that's not going to happen. So I'm not sure what will be the next chapter of my life. Well, I'm pretty sure you can continue to count on getting calls from me. I'm going to have you uh, contributing on the show as much as possible still in the future. Uh, real quick, as you kind of look back at the time you spent in office, how have things changed today as to way, the way they were when you first began? Great question. I mean, when I first began, we didn't deal with social media, um, didn't have a cell phone. Uh, people weren't texting me constantly. Um, it was a little less partisan. We aren't like, it, the Utah legislature is not like Washington, D.C. But, you know, when I started, there were more moderate Republicans. There were most more Democrats. We could get together with those two groups and actually pass or defeat legislation. I believe when either political party has too much control, every statewide house, every statewide office, over two thirds of the house, over two thirds of the Senate, that sometimes their extremists have more of a voice than they would have with, that, with more balance. And so that's changed. Um, I remember some of the, my mentors were wonderful moderate Republicans. All right, a uh, very distinguished career up at the Capitol. We appreciate your uh, time here with us today. Uh, taking a look back, and best of luck to you. And like I said, we'll still be calling, so we hope you answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate being called. Have Thank a great you. day. All right, still to come, the 2021 legislative session starts next week. We're checking in with a couple of state lawmakers for a preview. But first, the state of Utah officially has a new governor. What to expect from the transition to the Cox administration after the break. Just hours after officially being sworn in, Governor Spencer Cox handled the first item on his agenda, 
signing an executive order to get rid of potential barriers in the workplace. ABC 4's Nicole Newman reports on the transition to the new administration. At the Territorial State House in Fillmore. This is about occupational licensure. Governor Spencer Cox signed his first executive order in office with Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson bearing witness. The order is geared towards eliminating outdated workplace rules and regulations. Sometimes um, the very things that we did maybe many years ago uh, don't make sense today because circumstances have changed. For the governor, that includes a certain state of mind, symbolically signing an order to make Utah more inclusive. Unfortunately, racism does still exist in our country. Unfortunately, a founding principle of our country. We believe that Utah can be a leader in this space. And being a leader, what exactly will Cox's administration potentially look like? Well, I think there are a number of factors that we can look at. Tim Chambliss, a political science professor at the University of Utah, believes Cox's age, his out-of-state law education, and his familiarity with some minority communities and his rural upbringing will all shape his time as leader of the state. Has had experience the city, county, uh, and state levels in government. I've been impressed with the fact that he has been willing to be articulate and outspoken and inclusive in embracing Utah's uh, uh, different minority groups, people of color, uh, people who are uh, who support same-sex marriage. That was ABC 4's Nicole Newman reporting for us. In the last act of the year, Congress voted to end the practice of surprise medical billing. This will end unexpected out-of-network and emergency care for insured Americans. Washington correspondent Rashad Hudson explains. This is a big deal. Included in the large COVID-19 aid package passed by Congress last month is an eventual legal end to surprise medical billing. Well, we had people getting tens of thousands of dollars in bills like that. Indiana Congressman Larry Bouchon, a doctor himself, was one of many lawmakers who supported banning sending insured patients bills for the parts of their care that ended up being out of network. You're not gonna have to worry anymore that you're gonna get this bill six months later from a hospital or a physician that you weren't aware of. The legislation sets up a system that still pays the provider, but it does so without including the consumer in the process. Uh, so that it's their problem, not, not the insurer, not the, the patient who had no idea this was going on. Ohio Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown calls this a victory for patients. We prohibited that from happening to make the insurance companies deal with one another. The legislation gives insurers and providers 30 days to negotiate payment of out-of-network bills. If that fails, the claim then goes through an arbitrator who would have the final say. The law goes into effect at the start of 2022. In Washington, I'm Rashad Hudson. Still to come, unprecedented times as the 2021 legislative session is about to get underway. Our panel weighs in after the break. You're watching Inside Utah Politics. Time now to preview the upcoming legislative session with the Inside Utah Politics panel. This week we have State Representatives Candace Perucci and Jennifer Daly Provo. Ladies, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having, Thanks us. For having us. Let's uh, first dive into the overall feel. Here we are uh, about a week away and this is an unprecedented time. We started to see the impacts of, of COVID at the end of last session but definitely still different as, as we approach uh, this upcoming session. Representative Perucci, let's start with you. How are you feeling uh, in, this, in this time as we approach uh, opening day? You know, I am optimistic uh, for the 2021 legislative session. I think we have a lot of work to do um, in terms of uh, work as we recover from this pandemic and continue to uh, and look at our budget and how we can help Utahns uh, and also looking at education funding and the work that we're doing there. So I'm really excited about this session and uh, being able to be safely in person uh, with my colleagues, I'm also looking forward to. Uh, Representative Daly Provo, your thoughts? 
I agree with Representative Perucci. I am optimistic as well. Um, I'm, of course, I'm looking at how quickly we can um, make sure we get our citizenry vaccinated, keep people healthy, um, recover budget-wise, although Utah, we all know, has fared economically better than most states in the nation. Um, I, as a public health professional, I still have concerns about having too many people at the Capitol and the risk with uh, transmission rates. But I know that uh, I have confidence that everybody will do everything that they can to make sure that we all stay safe and to protect the, the respect the health and safety of others. Well, let's get into process. What can we expect process-wise? Uh, Representative Perucci, you already mentioned you look forward to being there in person. Will most of it be in person? Will there still be some uh, online so elements of this as well? It'll be a hybrid. So uh, members can opt in to be online or in person. Uh, you are required to wear a mask in person and we will be doing testing one to two times a week of our members. Uh, and then there will also be safe workplaces set aside in the Capitol uh, for individuals who do need to be up there. It is open to the public, but also again, the opportunity to participate online is available and participate in public comment that way, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. Obviously the sanitization process, um, and just in general, making sure we're doing everything we can to be safe while meeting is important. Representative Daly Provo, do you plan to be up there in person? I do as much as I can be. I will participate remotely where it's reasonable, but you know, the legislative process is a very personal process and is based on relationships and critical conversations. So I do plan to be there when I can safely. Um, we have a lot of colleagues and constituents who depend on us being effective and efficient. Um, but, you know, as to remote participation, I think that if nothing else, um, if no other good has come out of this pandemic, opening up that access to people who do have difficulty in attending meetings at the Capitol in person, um, that will be available to everybody. We just need to make sure that people know how to access that. Yeah, in all walks of life, COVID has changed our lives. And in many ways, I think some of the things will stick around and, and that's probably a perfect example mm -hmm. of how the legislative process will probably be forever changed as well. All right, we kind of uh, dove into this a little bit, but let's get more into it. Priorities, Representative Perucci, what's the most important thing you and your colleagues need to take care of this legislative session? So obviously we're gonna be looking on COVID relief and what we can do uh, for those individuals who have been impacted, whether it be uh, unemployment or uh, looking at housing. Um, that's important. We're also obviously having robust conversations on the separation of powers and emergency powers of health departments and the executive branch. Um, really excited for our education and the chance to restore the 6% increase to the WPU and also provide a bonus to our teachers who have been working so hard. Uh, so those are really important. We also have set aside uh, funding for a tax cut uh, to provide again some relief for our U the Utahns that we represent. Representative Daly Provo, your thoughts on the most important thing you and your colleagues need to tackle this legislative session? Well, we have seen that Utah can be relatively well, or is relatively resilient in, in times of economic downturn, but we do, we, you know, we invested a lot of money to keep the ship afloat in the pandemic, spent down our rainy day funds, so we need to make sure that we continue to protect vulnerable communities in our state. The vaccine rollout is going to be really, really critical as we monitor and support those efforts for our departments of health. Um, like Representative Perucci said, education funding, it's going to be a really exciting year to see the legislature step up and fulfill promises made on education funding and supporting our teachers, certainly. Um, I will be watching closely decisions made about social services going forward. Um, now more than ever, we need to make sure that everybody in our state has access to good quality health care. Um, as a member of Social Services Appropriations, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can do a lot to help some of our most disenfranchised Utahns in the years going forward. Uh, this, is, this is also a big year for redistricting. I want to get both of your thoughts on that. We do have the commission that will be making recommendations, uh, but ultimately it's the legislature's decision on these uh, congressional boundaries. How do you see that playing out, Representative Perucci? So I think obviously based on process, there's a committee that looks at that. We also have the commission that's been created. I would just encourage our fellow Utahns to participate in the process. You'll, there'll be an online 
uh, option for you to actually contribute your recommendations and ideas. And one of our state board districts actually came from uh, Utah's recommendation. And so I think we'll be working on that, obviously. Um, and, and I'm not on that committee, but I uh, have been in discussions where they're, they're preparing for that. And uh, with the census data coming out, we've been told that it's going to be a little bit slower to come out, um, looking more like July. Um, but obviously that'll be important in the decision-making process. Representative Daly Provo, Provo, what are you going to be watching for? Do you anticipate fair boundaries by the time this is all said and done? Well, I certainly think that everybody goes into this uh, hoping for the best and most fair process that we can implement. I was uh, really actively involved in the redistricting process 10 years ago in listening to those discussions and um, I I think that our state would be a lot better off if more people felt enfranchised by our congressional representation. Um, but I also am more personally interested in seeing what kind of changes come about in our state legislature as well. I, I want to get both of your thoughts on another important issue. Uh, you take a look at what's happening nationally, just so much division and divide. On Wednesday, we saw Congress dispute the election and, and everything that played out from that. Why is it here in the state of Utah that the two parties work so much better together in our legislative session than what we see <laughs> on a national level? Representative Perucci, let's start with you. I think that's a great question, and I think what we're seeing nationally is heartbreaking. Um, and I think we have to get to a place where we view our neighbors who disagree with us as fellow Americans and not enemies. And honestly, I think up at, the, up at the legislature, we're all there to do right by Utahns and represent our constituents. And we have to work together on that. Um, and, and I really do think that although we may disagree and have different policy ideas, at the end of the day, we all really do want what's best for Utahns. And um, I think our constituents need to demand of us that civil dialogue, right? And that willingness to interact. In fact, the system uh, demands it, that we are working together as, uh, as representatives to form the best policies that we can. Representative Daly Provo, it's very uh, usual to see a party line vote in the nation's capital here though. A vast majority of our bills will have bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, we do have a, a long history of a collaborative process and as a Democrat in Utah, I can't pass any bills without Republican support. And I've also really always prided myself on stri really striving and finding those areas where we can find common ground. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have conversations about difficult issues where we don't necessarily agree on issues, um, but I have so much respect and admiration for my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, and you know, this is one of the beauties about being able to attend the session in person, even mm -hmm. through the pandemic, is that, that personal relationship and those interactions and how critical they are. Um, I, it's one of the reasons that I love working on state level policy because I know that we still have a great opportunity to get meaningful work done. That doesn't mean that I'm not always going to push the boundaries on things that I really believe in, my constituents really believe in, um, but you know, I am provided that respectful space for dialogue mm -hmm. and conversation as much as any of my colleagues. Okay, we have and about a minute left, but I want to give both of you the opportunity to uh, give us a real quick rundown of what you are working on individually. Representative Perucci. So I'm working on a bill that uh, addresses emergency contracts, as we've seen, and putting some more transparency and accountability in the process and limiting that to a 30-day contract and requiring it to go to a competitive process after that. I'm also working on a military retirement income tax exemption. Um, we're one of the last few states that tax military retirement income. I have a, a few other bills I'm working on, uh, one that's looking at domestic violence. We've seen an increase in lethality uh, during COVID and, and what resources we can provide to our officers and uh, a, a bill related to impact fees for my area. Okay, Representative Daly Provo, what are you working on? So one of my top priorities is to finally get some infrastructure in the state to break down the digital divide. Uh, we've seen during COVID more than ever how critical access to high-speed internet is mm -hmm. just to participate in everyday um, activities, including school and work, and we still have a lot of areas where those, those are significant, there are significant barriers mm -hmm. for people, so I'd like to look at that. Um, criminal justice reform, um, access to health care and medications for vulnerable communities. All right. Um, we are unfortunately <laughs> going to have to end it on that note. Uh, great conversation, though. Looking forward to covering the session. And thank you so much for your insight today.
Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for having us. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more Inside Utah Politics right after the break. We leave you now with a look at what's on the radar in the world of politics. We've been talking all about it. The legislative session gets underway on Tuesday, January 19th. The presidential inauguration is the following day, Wednesday, January 20th. And the final day of the legislative session is Friday, March 5th. Make sure to connect with me on social media. I'd like to know what you think of this show and other issues important to you. You can email me at InsideUtahPolitics at ABC4.com. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Just log on and search Glenn Mills ABC4. Thanks so much for making us part of your day. We hope to see you again next week as we go inside Utah politics. <music>